Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we are at Battleship Cove in Fall River, Massachusetts on the Battleship Massachusetts. And I'm here with my counterpart, Chris Nardi. Uh, Chris was the curator of Battleship Cove for a number of years and is currently the director of operations here. And he has been involved with Battleship Cove since 1987. So anyone on there who thinks I know what I'm talking about, this guy has literally been doing this since before I was born. Today, Chris is gonna tell us about one of the radio rooms here on Battleship, Massachusetts. Hello, so we're in Radio 2 on the third um, deck, of, sorry, the first platform of Battleship, Massachusetts. And uh, Radio 2 was also known as the Radio Transmitter Room. So um, there are two transmitter rooms on the Battleship. One, the second one, the one that we're not in, is called Radio 3, or the Emergency Radio Room, which was used in case um, something went wrong with the equipment here. So we have an array of, of transmitters here, all vacuum tube technology, of course. Uh, the first one here is called the TAJ. This was very common to all the World War II ships. It was used on the emergency uh, frequency. It's a low-frequency transmitter. The next one is called the TBM or TBK, depending on its configuration, which is very minor differences in terms of which one is which. Next down is um, TBS. Again, ubiquitous throughout the fleet, especially during World War II, or probably only during World War II for the most part. Uh, it was also known as talk between ships, and it was a short-range VHF radio um, used for tactical operations. And another very common radio is a self, uh, transmit, self-contained transmitter. It's called a TDE. Very, very easy to install. The motor generator is right on the bottom. This is the one we use the most here. All, this, all of these units are restored and in operating condition on uh, legal ham radio frequencies, even, they, the, even the TBS. Are they the original radios from the ship or have you stripped them from other vessels? No, these are all original. We have, when, I, when we started the restoration down here, there were things missing or things that had, had uh, uh, were defective, you know, like capacitors and such, but you know, mostly meters were missing. We found the right ones and put them back in. And the things we've had the most trouble with, of course, are the motor generators. Uh, so as those um, default or they become defective, we have to have them rewound, which is kind of expensive. But we've been able to manage through donations and such over the years. Um, so Radio 2 also had, again, which is a, another work in progress here aboard the battleship, but so things are kind of rough. But we have the ship's entertainment system was fed from here. And I happened to have a conversation with, he passed away a few years ago, but it was an officer who was assigned to this as his collateral duty, who came down here and played the records uh, during obviously non-battle operations uh, from, this, from this spot right here. And this is so that the, um, the record player and receivers and other things were fed, including the ship's organ, which is not down here, it's in the band room, were fed into the, the three channels of the ship's entertainment system. Um, on the other end of this room is the motor generator room which supplies the high voltage to the, the, the tubes that are used in these, in these transmitters. Over here is the receiving um, table, on the receiving tables, um, and to the left is a, is a uh, frequency uh, generator, which um, would determine if they were told they had to be on a certain frequency, they would create the frequency by making adjustments on this unit. That's a model LR, which again, all this stuff, even on the smaller ships, a lot of this was common. Maybe not this unit because it's so big, but these receivers uh, were re very highly regarded in terms of their quality and, uh, and their longevity it speaks, for, it speaks for itself. So the receivers were um, designed to accommodate a wide range of frequencies all the way from half a megacycle all the way up to 27 or so, in, at least in this operation. There's some aircraft stuff up in the upper decks of the superstructure that would the whole different range of frequencies. Um, so each radio desk has a typewriter for, for copying messages, a light, and a key. And sometimes we have a gentleman that comes here from New Jersey, actually, who operates, and he uses this key, which plugs into the normal straight key. And that, so people who are really skilled, not and I, I'm not a member of that group at, the, at this point, but they know how to use this key, and which is a much more efficient way of operating um, CW, which is also known as uh, Morse code. Um, now, uh, what makes this operation really neat on the battleship, or on any, again, any ship of this vintage, are the transfer panels, which enable these equipments to be operated from many spots on the ship. So this is a transmitter patch panel, which allows 
any one of these transmitters in this space to be operated from lots and lots of places on the ship. For example, um, Radio Central, which does not have any transmitters in it, any table up there, any operator's table can operate a transmitter down in this space. Any receiver audio can be patched to a number of spots on the ship. And then next to these transmitters are thinner units called modulators, which allowed voice um, transmission, which land estate was not used that often during the war. I think the most often used transmitter was actually the TBS for tackle, again, tactical short range operations. This was the radio supervisor table. This is not, unfortunately, that was gone when we got down here. Um, we hope to find the right one at some point. Most, elect most you know, combat, combat um, and control um, spots on the ship have an intercom. Um, this one happens to be um, 22 MC, which is radio, called radio signals. This, this works as well to, so we can talk to the other radio rooms when we're setting stuff up. Um, and what else can I show you in here? Um, there were lockers in here, which are still here, with spare parts, spare tubes. Um, we have uh, the manuals uh, for, the, for the equipment in another uh, spot there underneath the TBS. And there were, from what I've been able to determine down here, there were kind of a few revolutions of this, of this radio space, but um, over there was a very large um, transmitter that the USS Alabama still has, which is called a TBA. Can, the thing is so big, it could almost live in it. And I understand that was water cooled. Um, so this is the final. This is the final 1946 configuration. Um, you know, the, her, this ship received an overhaul post-war, and this is the way. What that's what we restored to. Um, but there are remnants of previous configurations in this space that are interesting to look at. When you look at the records, you can match up to what what the records say to what would, what used to be mounted in certain spots. So it's kind of like. It's like a little bit of archaeology to, to re, you know, recreate what, what the way it was at certain times in the war. It was a, any, any ship is a constantly evolving uh, a configuration of equipment in terms of what their needs were and how technology developed. One of two transmitter rooms on the ship. So there are four radio rooms all told. Radio 2, which we're standing in. Radio 3, which is the emergency radio room. Radio Central, which is the main, you know, what most people are used to in a museum ship, which is where all the receivers are and where the main activity happened, where, you know, messages were passed from the coding room into, or passed from to back and forth between Radio Central and the coding room, typically. And then we have a VHF radio room that was a post-war uh, installation up on the old floor level. So that enabled um, CIC to communicate with um, aircraft and such and some and, and beach installations as well. So that again, a lot of stuff on here was designed to be operated remotely. So the VHF radio room on the old floor level, there's, there are no operating positions in there. Everything is tied down to CIC on the third deck. And the interesting thing about that is that was a heck of a lot. That was a heck of a project because CIC and the ship was on the old floor level during World War II and they moved everything down below the armor post-war. Uh, I think she was the last South Dakota ship to get that modification. So to do all that wiring, just, it was amazing to me that they had to do all that cabling between seven decks to make that all work. So I'm sure they weren't happy about it when they got the work order. Radio 2 is not on the tour route because it's vertical access and uh, that's a safety issue. I mean, we might possibly be able to conquer that someday. We do take people down here for special tours that, you know, where we can control the safety. Um, Radio Central is definitely open to the public. You can walk right through the middle. Radio Central is divided. It, it was one open space, but we had to, in order to accommodate visitors, we split. We have plexiglass on both sides, so they can walk right through the middle of the radio room. And both are accessible by us when we have events here. Both sides, that is. The VHF room is definitely visible to the public. That's, uh, that's a, a place you look into when you're on the O4 level, going towards the bridge. And Radio 3 is also... Um, you know, give some idea of what Radio 2 looks like because the same type of transmitters are in there, not as many, and you can look through the door that leads to that space. Radio 3 on the ship was also the uh, training room for the ship. Uh, there are 16, I'm sorry, four, uh, 14 spots in there. There's a big, two long tables with um, keys and headphones, and that's where they trained the radio men on the ship, and we now use that to, tr to teach Morse code to our overnight scouts. That, and you can, again, you can see most of that by looking through the door that has a plexiglass cutout in it when you're on the tour.
Amateur radio operators are always welcome to come here and operate. We actually, we, we prefer to have people that are familiar with CW, which is uh, known as a short for continuous wave, which is Morse code operation, because um, the, the units here are more set up to, to accommodate that versus doing voice transmission. But they, they both work, but we're always uh, happy to have people come, offer to come here and, and operate CW from this ship. It's, we have our own call sign, of course, and uh, when we get on the air, um, we get a lot of positive comments. So please reach out if that's something you'd like to do. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section down below. If you are interested in doing overnights and potentially learning Morse code on Battleship Massachusetts, we've got a link in the description to their website so you can keep an eye on it for when the pandemic is over and they restart their overnight program. So we're going to put a link down there for how to donate if you are interested in financially supporting Battleship Code. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from viewers like you. Thank you for your support. And remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we put out new content.